And you'll find out as we walk through Romans chapter 7 that there is going to, we're going to show you that the law has a general application and it has a spiritual application. The general application is law has a restraint for outward activity, just like today. We have civil laws, we have law enforcement, don't we? And you'll see that the civil law and law enforcement, what does it do? It governs outward actions, doesn't it? What would happen if there was no civil law? There was no law enforcement. Chaos, anarchy, everywhere. Well, you've already seen that in Boston when they told the police to pull back, told law enforcement to pull back, told law to pull back. There was no restraint. So law has an effect on outward, restraining outward actions. But civil law cannot harness desires and imaginations and, and evil intents of the heart, evil thoughts of the heart, that if it could have its way, it would do it. Law cannot do that. And law really can't point that out. Even the outward application of the law can't point that out. It's when the Holy Ghost takes the, the spirit of the law and applies it to the heart of an individual, the heart of the individual will then begin to see, not only is my outward actions wrong, but I got so many inward things that are wrong that, that I cannot restrain. Uh, they're just out of control, and they become heavy-weighted, heavy-burdened over this, and they begin to see their need of a Savior. Think about each and every one of you in here. Did you ever think you had a need of a Savior just because you knew that you did some outward things that were wrong? Or did you see that your need of a Savior because you knew that inwardly things weren't right? Inwardly, you knew things weren't right. God gets things right on the inside by helping you to show, show you that things on the inside aren't right. That's what he tries to help you see. And uh, so we're going to look at this today. To Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. You're real close there. Look at verse 15. It says, but you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received... What does it say? But you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, before, when you were serving God under the letter of the law, just serving him in the light of what the law said outwardly and trying to conform to it, there was a spirit of bondage about all of that. There was a spirit of bondage. Uh, look at Acts chapter 15. Look at Acts chapter 15. And... Um, Notice what it says over here, Acts chapter 15. And notice in verse 5, it says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so verse 6 says, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And so there was a great discussion about this. And then you go down and you look at uh, verse 10, and you have the Apostle Peter saying, Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples? That would be, in other words, if they have to be circumcised and to, be, and to keep the law of Moses. But, uh, but why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. In other words, he's talking about the bondage of trying to conform to the law in the outward sense. It was bondage. It was bondage. It's bondage because you don't have a heart for it. And to keep the law meant not only keeping the, 12, the, excuse me, the Ten Commandments, but it also meant that you, you, know, you had to be circumcised and you had to follow all the dietary laws and all of those things. And all of that became bondage to those that practiced it. And so he says over here in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, that God has not given us a spirit of bondage. So when you, if you recall, when before you came to Christ, uh, the reason why you'd have any attempt to serve God at all was out of fear of judgment and fear of hell. And, and uh, alongside that, you wanted to be accepted by others as one that, at least appeared to be living a good life. Okay? These were your motivations. Uh, the, it says of the rulers that believed in Jesus, but they would not confess him openly because 
they, were, they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue for they loved the praises of men rather than the praises of God. So when a person is serving God, or excuse me, attempting to serve God through the oldness of the letter, they're interested in how you feel about me. Do you think I'm spiritual? Do you think I pray enough? I'm standing in the street corners, the Pharisees say, and I pray so everybody can see me. Am I praying enough? I, uh, I, I tithe even of my, uh, of my little herbs that I have. I tithe a tenth of them. And they want you to know what they're doing. They, uh, it's almost like if I have your approval, I must have God's approval. Listen, you can have the approval of men and not have the approval of God. You need to understand that. The Pharisees were out for the approval of man, but not out for the approval of God. They were not interested in the approval of God. They were only interested in the approval of men. But they thought, they, nevertheless, they had the approval of God because they had the approval of man. And after all, men think I'm spiritual, so, 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 so should God. And we are doing our best to conform to the outward uh, uh, letter of the word, the letter of the law, like the rich young ruler said, I have kept this from my youth up. So he never seen himself ever offend God. Do you remember the Pharisee and the publican? They're standing together. The publican is over here. The Pharisee is over here. And he says, and he begins to pray, and he lists all the things that he does. He says, I think I'm not like others. I'm not like these adulterers. I'm not like these others. I'm not like this publican. He never seen that there was any need for God's mercy in his life. He never seen that there was any reason to ask God to forgive him. But on the other hand, the spiritual law, the spiritual principle of the law was applied to the publican's heart, and he seen himself for what he really was. And he says, oh my God, please have mercy upon me. The Pharisee never since, uh, seen that because he was satisfied with his own confidence. Even the Apostle Paul, when you read in Philippians chapter 3, and you look over there from verses 4 to verse 6. He says, well, I was a Pharisee of a Pharisee. He says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was of the seed of uh, the stock of, uh, of, of Abraham, the seed uh, and of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, according to the law, blameless. Did he see his need for a Savior in that condition? See how outward conformity blinds you? to what you really need on the inside. I mean, there's a lot of folks that could be watching us today in our program. You have outward conformity down pat. You could be like the Apostle Paul before he met Christ on the road to Damascus. But inwardly, you're not conforming at all to what God wants. You have to understand, folks, that, <clears throat> that this spirit of bondage that people have in trying to serve God through the outward letter of the law there's no freedom there. You don't see those people uh, uh, desiring or wanting to serve God, wanting to go to church, wanting to be with other Christians, wanting to study their Bible, wanting to pray, wanting to witness, wanting to share their testimony. They don't, you don't have that with those people. They are just content. I said my prayer. I did my, my few things I was supposed to do. I'm a Christian now. Leave me alone. No, when you're a Christian... You cannot help but serve God. Do you hear that? When you're a Christian, you're being changed into the image and the likeness of Jesus. And being changed in the image and likeness of Jesus, Jesus could not help but serve God. Jesus could not help but serve God and keep the spirit of the law as well as the written element of the law. He couldn't help. A Christian can't help it either. That's the desire in their heart. That's what motivates them. We got two motives. We got two motives. The motive for the person who serves God with the letter of the law, the most moral man among us. Because remember, Paul's making a point here. He's going to take the most moral people among us that are in the flesh, that are under the law, that are conforming outwardly. He's, going to, he's comparing those people here with people of, that are serving God in newness of spirit. They got new hearts. They've been born again. They're in Christ. They're dead to sin. They're dead to the law. They're married to Christ. They can bear fruit unto God. These, these, two these two people, they may sometimes outwardly look the same, but inwardly they're far different. They're far different. Over here, these are not new creatures. Over here, they are new creatures. Over here, they're in Adam. Over here, they're in Christ. Over here, they're uh, in the flesh. Over here, they're in the spirit. Over here, they're under the law. Over here, they're under grace. 
Over here, they're in bondage. They got wrong motives. They have no liberty to serve God from their heart. Over here, they got stony hearts. Over here, we got fleshly hearts. Over here, they're trying to conform to something on the outside. Over here, we are conforming to something that's already placed to us on the inside, and we want to serve God. It's our heart to serve God. Over here, they don't have any true love for God, just for who God is. Over here, they have a true love for God, for who God is. Over here, they want God just to bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them. Over here, they're happy when God blesses them, but if God never blessed them, they're going to serve them. Right. See, it's totally different. And, and this is what he's saying. The, he's trying to show us there's a difference here. When we were once in the flesh, this is how we lived. This is how we acted. This is how we were. We were in bondage. We had wrong motives in serving God. We didn't even understand the real truth about the law. We thought the law, if it was kept outwardly, it was fine. But over here, we know that we can keep the law outwardly, but it also needs to be kept inwardly. It has to be kept inwardly. We know that adultery is just as wrong on, uh, in lusting and desiring to enjoy someone as it is over here doing it outwardly. We know it's wrong. We know over here that murder is something in the heart that to be angry over uh, against somebody without cause is the same as murder. Over here, they say, no, we can be angry with you. We can even crucify Jesus if we want to. It's not murder. That's how, how goofed up you are when you're in the flesh and under the law. You're not, everything is superficial over here. You ever notice when you became a Christian and over time as, as the Lord got a hold of your heart and started sharing more things with you, you began to turn and look back behind you and you seen how superficial it was? Now it's so superficial. You know over here this isn't superficial, this is supernatural. This is awesome, this is incredible, this is of God. This is God enabling me to be somebody and to live some way that I never ever could before. Over here we had no ability to walk in the light of the principle, that hidden life principle in the law. We had no ability over here. We, the, the, our flesh was too weak. We just could not do it. Over here, our flesh is still weak, but we have a power that's bigger than us and then beyond us. We have an ability given to us that we're able to live this life because we're, we're married to Jesus Christ. He enables us to live this. Can you see that? See, the newness of spirit, in the spirit, under grace, in Christ, Oldest of the letters. See the difference? And this is what he's saying here. Let's look at it, verse 6. It says, but now we have been delivered from the law. We've been delivered from this over here. Having died to it, which we were held, we were held by that. That's, that's, that's where we were at. So that we should now serve in newness of spirit and not oldest of the letter. We are serving in newness of spirit, not in oldest of the letter. We are not to look at outward conformity. That's where churches can get in trouble when they make all these laws and rules about your hairdo, your clothing you wear, and all these different things as though it's a sign of holiness. Now look, I believe that every Christian woman ought to know how to dress. And every Christian man needs to know how to dress. And once your heart is changed, you're not going to have a problem knowing how to dress. Okay? So simple. It's so simple. You start making rules and laws and things over that kind of stuff, you're taking people to serve God under the oldness of the letter and not the newness of the Spirit. Right. All right. Are we ready to move on to another verse? Let's go into another verse. Verse 7. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Now, why is he asking that question? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law causing all these problems in my life? Is the law stirring up all these passions in my life? What's he say? Certainly not. Stop that right now. Stop thinking that way. He's in these, in these uh, proposed questions that he's bringing, he knows that he's addressing wrong ideas about what he's teaching and preaching on. You got to remember, he's talking to a lot of people that they just think the law is it but they all have a wrong idea of the law. He say no, certainly not. Look at his next word is. On the what? On the contrary. On the contrary, just the opposite is true. The law is not sin. Just the opposite. It's anything but sin. On the contrary, I would not have known sin 
except through the law. Now, we're going to have to take our time right here, everybody, because there's going to be, I want you to help you see that there's an outward application to the law, and there's an inward application to the law, okay? We looked at that already, Rob, at 2 Corinthians 3, 3. You might want to put that back up there. There's the outward application of the law where God wrote the law on, on tablets of stone that depicted the stony hearts it was being applied to, okay? That's the outward application of the law. Then, he says, we don't minister in that way. He says, but we minister by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the fleshly tablets of the heart. That means when we minister, the Spirit of God is involved, and when He is involved, He takes the veil off of the hearts of the people, and they're able to see the truth. In fact, let's just go on over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's just take a peek at this a little bit, if we could. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Rob, you're there. I'll show you where to bounce down to once I get there. Um, Verse 13 says, unlike Moses, who put a veil, this is 2 Corinthians 3, 3, or 3, 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look stead, steadily at the end of what was passing away. Now, what was the end of what was passing away? That which was given to him. It was given to him, but it was passing away, meaning in the sense that one day it was going to be set aside because grace is going to come. Okay. Uh, but the minds, uh, but their minds were blinded for until this day. Now look at this. This is really important. Verse 14. Until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. So that means that when people heard the law, uh, expounded, and the Pharisees expound the law, Paul, as, as Saul, before coming to Christ, expounded the law. When the people were listening to them, there was a veil over them, over their minds, and they could not see the spirit of the law. They could not see that hidden principle in the law. They could not see it. So they were bound to outward conformity. That's the best they could have. That's why when Jesus came, he came to people that were just bound to outward conformity. The Pharisees were that way. The rulers, the leaders were that way. But, and all the people were that way as well. That's why when Jesus came, and he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he began to introduce to them the spirit of the law, the hidden life principle in the law, that it has more to do than just rules uh, uh, and, uh, and regulations, duties and obligations, do's and don'ts. There was something bigger and greater than that, but that was hidden from the people. But Jesus came and he began to teach it. And that's exactly why these Pharisees hated Jesus. Because in teaching and preaching the way he did, he exposed their sinfulness, and they didn't want their sinfulness to be exposed. Jesus said, they would not come unto me, that they might have life from me, because they loved their darkness and didn't want to come to me and have their, their, their practice of sin exposed. They didn't want it. They didn't want it. And so, as you read on here, you find out, but in verse 15, but to this, to this day, when Moses is read, the veil lies on, on their heart. Nevertheless, in verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Spirit, now the Spirit, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And so we have bondage when you're in the flesh, under the law. Remember that? Outward conformity, you're in bondage. But over here, you have this Spirit of liberty. We cry, Abba, Father. And here, the Lord is that Spirit. See how you have liberty and newness of Spirit? You have all of that. But there is an outward application of the law that never reaches the heart. It's the exact same way, everybody, when it comes to the proclamation of the gospel. Have you ever read that passage of scripture in the Bible that says, many are called, but few are chosen? And you wonder, what does that mean? What in the world is that all about? Well, the many that are called is the general proclamation of the gospel, going to the ends of the earth. And people are hearing about Jesus. When you watch Ray Comfort, you hear... Every once in a while, people say, well, you know, what did God do to save you, to, or to save you from this? He said, well, the, he sent his son Jesus. He died on the cross. He died for our sins. But it's just only been, a, it's only come to them outwardly. It's never been applied to them inwardly. 
Theologians call the outward proclamation of the gospel the outward general call that everybody hears. Many are called. Many hear that, okay? But then he goes on to say, few are chosen. That is when you read in the scriptures where God says to the, to the Jew, uh, it's a stumbling block, and to the, and to the Greek, it's foolishness. But to us who are called... Christ is the power of God. So in other words, there's an, infection, uh, uh, an effectual call, something that goes beyond the general call, beyond the outward ears, beyond, beyond your mind sitting, sitting up here in your noggin, and it goes right into your heart. Because God gives you a heart prepared for that message. When God gives you a heart prepared for that message, that message shows you where you've been with God, shows you your sins for what they were, and it has this positive impact upon you that, ah, oh, my sinfulness, I'm so wrong, I'm so wrong. Please forgive me, have mercy on me. And what's happening? You're, you're turning away from it. What's the cause of your turning away? God is. He's turning you away from it. He's turning you to faith in Jesus Christ. That is the outward call, many are chosen, excuse me, many are called, the effectual call, few are chosen. Same thing with the law. The law has an outward proclamation, and then you have this inward application that uh, Rob wrote about up here, or Rob showed you up here, he wrote about it. <laughs> Rob showed you what was written about it in 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Rob looks like the Apostle Paul, but he's not. Uh, interesting. Isn't this interesting? You stop and think about all these things. It's so interesting. And uh, can you see now, can you see how foolish it is for pastors and ministers and Christians wanting to stop and say a prayer with somebody because they heard that they went through a divorce, they heard that they had a need, they heard they're having a problem, a struggle, what have you. Well, you just need the Lord. Would you like to pray with me? Well, come on. One, you didn't even give them the general call. Two, there's no effectual call. <laughs> you're just trying to get them to say a prayer because you're like the Catholic priest who thinks if I baptize your baby, they're in. And if you say this prayer, you're in. No one who said a prayer is in, and no one who got baptized as a baby is in. How do you get in? You're brought in supernaturally. Look what it says over here in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6. Look at this, uh, these passages in verse 44 and 45. Now, verse 45 is going to lend itself to what we're teaching on over here in Romans 7. In, Rome, uh, in John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, no one can. Now, is that word can uh, a word of opportunity, uh, a word that depicts decision, or a word that depicts ability? No one can. That means no one has the ability, right? So no one has the ability to come to me unless something has to happen. Unless what? The Father who sent me draws them. In other words, the only people that are going to get to Jesus in a saving way is, are the people that God draws to Jesus. Now, is there any information here that shows us how he may draw you to Jesus? He says, no one comes to me unless the Father uh, who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up in the last day. Notice, if you're drawn to Jesus and you come to Jesus, what happens in the last day? You're raised up. What's that talking about? It's talking about eternal security, being saved by Jesus Christ. Now, what, look at verse 45. Verse 45 is very interesting, everybody. It says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Now, who's all going to be taught of God? Those that are drawn to Jesus. The scripture before it helps us understand the interpretation of this verse. No one can come unless they're drawn by the Father. It is written, verse 45, in the prophets that they shall all be taught. Who shall all be taught? Those that the Father draws to Jesus. They shall be all taught of God. Therefore, he says, because of this, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, what will they do? They'll come to me. Can they be kept from coming to me? No. If they hear and learn from the Father, they're going to come to Christ. Now, the question is, what do they hear and learn from the Father? When we get into Romans chapter 7, you're going to find out. Hearing and learning from the Father is hearing and learning about the life principle in the law. 
the spirit of the law. Because it's the spirit of the law that's going to show you your need of a Savior. He's not, God is not drawing people to Jesus to say, Lord, Lord, and walk around, do all kinds of wonderful things, only to hear Jesus at the last day say, depart from me, I never knew you. No, God is going to bring you to a place of saying, Jesus, you're my Lord, because in a saving way, I believe you came and you died for me because you had to die for me. If you did die for me, I would be lost forever. You see the absolute necessity of his death. You see the absolute necessity of him being born of a, wo born of a woman, being born under the law, to represent you as one who's, who's under the condemnation of the law, so he could live the life you could not live, and he could give his life for you and pay a debt he did not owe, a debt too big for you to pay, and you see that. God helps you to see that. He helps you to see that the only escape that you have, the only escape that you have from the power of sin, the condemnation of the law, is found in his son Jesus. Always remember, true gospel preaching always brings up the law. In fact, you cannot even understand Jesus and why he died if you don't understand the law. He was born under the law to redeem you and I that were under the law. He went under the law and he lived what we couldn't live. He took the burden of our condemnation of the law upon himself. He suffered for us. Now, that's only going to mean something to you if you hear and learn from the Father that you have transgressed his law. Now, the person that only hears the law outwardly looks at sin lightly. The Pharisees were all conforming outwardly. You and I used to be conforming outwardly. Remember that? Serving in oldness of the letter. Did we look at sin as a big deal? We laughed about it. We, we fluffed it all off. Uh, was there, was there, uh, did we hold any reverence towards God? Were we concerned that we ever sinned against somebody or we lied to somebody or took something that didn't belong to us? Were we really heartfelt concerned about that we wanted to make it right? No, there's all outward conformity. The true nature of sin was hidden from us. And if the true nature of sin is hidden from you, the true reason for why Christ came is hidden from you. You have to see the true nature of sin. You have to see the true nature of yourself to see the true nature of God's love for you and his mercy upon you and why he would send his son to die for you. You will never see it unless you hear and learn from the Father. <coughs> this is the sovereignty of God. This is where God in his sovereignty moves upon a person. That's why when I walked out to... Uh, the John Deere parking lot that night and got saved. There was men and women all around me walking out. I was the one under conviction. I was the one that was hearing and learning from the Father. I never even asked to hear and learn from the Father. He just came and helped me to hear and learn from Him. And before 10, 15 minutes were passed, I'm sitting in my car, sickened by my lostness, sickened by my sinfulness, sickened by the idea that I transgressed against God. That was like the worst day of my life to find out that I sinned against God. I found out what I really was. And I wanted to escape it. I wanted to get away from it. I wanted to be saved. I didn't know how to be saved. I wanted to be forgiven. I didn't know how to be forgiven. Until the Lord began to speak to my heart that this is because of Jesus. Jesus will save you. Jesus will do this where you cry out to him. See, now listen to me. God has to do this for a person. Salvation is totally of God and not at all of man. It's not of the preacher or the person being saved. It's totally of God. When will the preachers of America and around the world begin to realize that only God can save a lost soul? Only God can do it. Only God can do it. And if he doesn't do it, it's not done. And no one has control over God drawing somebody to Christ and hearing and learning from the Father. You have no control over that. None whatsoever. And this is what makes salvation so dear and special to our hearts. We realize if it were not for you, Lord, if it were not for you putting your mercy on us, if it were not you for being gracious to us, if it were not for you dying on the cross, if it were not for you coming to us and letting us hear and learn from the Father, we would be in our same state, in our same position. But you took us out that we might be brought in.